this video, I'm going to be talking about CERTES in an FPGA. Some people call it CERTES, CERTES. Uh, it stands for Serializer Deserializer, and it's a main component used in a lot of FPGAs. It's a little bit more of an advanced topic, um, so I'm going to give you some background about serial data communication, parallel data communication, the differences between the two. Um, and this is all for wired communication, not wireless. This is wireless is something totally separate. Um, so, but you might have seen an FPGA data sheet that looks something like this. Um, this is like a Vertex 7 from Xilinx, and they call out something here, transceivers. There's three different types of transceivers, and then in parentheses, they have a, a max rate, usually measured in gigabits per second. So I've outlined that here in this red box. Uh, and if you've seen this before and you've, you've never needed to use a Serdis transceiver, you might be wondering what these are for. Um, and I'm going to go into detail about exactly what these transceivers or CERTES blocks uh, do uh, for you in, inside of an FPGA. As you can see, they're pretty common on some of the higher end FPGAs. Um, a lot of, and there's a lot of them, like 30 something transceivers at you know pretty fast frequencies. So uh, before we jump into the CERTES transceivers, I would do want to give you a little bit of background about um, more generally parallel and serial data. So. Um, Let's see, on the left side, we have an LPT cable. This is an old printer cable. This is a parallel style of communication. PCI, like might be found in your motherboard, that is a parallel interface. These are more of the old uh, interfaces for communication. And people have really switched to serial, serial communication more recently. For example, USB, universal serial bus. HDMI is a serial communication. Your lightning cable is serial. Um, serial is the present and future of high-speed uh, communication interfaces, and I'll go into the details of why. So I think it's an important background to have when you're when you're using an FPGA with CERTES transceivers on them. Why do you need them in the first place? So quick overview of parallel. So parallel has many pins. It's limited in its speed and therefore usually limited in bandwidth, and it's a past, and it is still used in the present uh, because it's so simple. Um, if you don't have large bandwidth needs, parallel works fine for a lot of applications. Not all applications, but many. And this is what it looks like from a transmitter and receiver. You know, trans data goes out the transmitter and in the receiver. The channel is just wires, in, you know, one wire for every line of data you want to send, and it's pretty straightforward. Contrary to that, there is serial-based communication. Um, usually has less pins, but it's much faster. So higher bandwidth applications, you know, your HDMIs and things like that with your high data rates. And it is the, the present and future for high-speed bandwidth needs. Um, one downside to serial is that it generally uses more power than a parallel interface, but you get more data. So a bit of a trade-off there. And it is complicated. For sure it is complicated. And we're going to go through that. I'm going to demystify it for you and hopefully make it a little less complicated. But just to show you briefly, you know, transmitter now looks complicated. Uh, there's, there's a PLL, phase lock loop, there's a serializer, an output stage, your channel looks different, uh, your receiver is different too, there's a CDR block, we're going to talk about these things. Um, but it's still, fundamentally, it's still data in on the transmitter, you know, the four data in lines and the four data out lines on the receiver. So you're still sending and receiving data, but how you get that data to go through your channel is, is different, and we'll, we'll demystify it. Let's jump in a little bit. Um, so first of all, a little background on parallel data. You're probably familiar with this. There is something called a clock that goes between zero and one. There is something called data. And when there is an edge on your clock, you use that edge to sample your data line. And that's that's how you get your, your data um, across a synchronous interface or clocked interface, parallel interface. You can add more data lines to get more bandwidth. Um, but, you know, I squared C, for example, which is a picture, this is what this is, is just one clock, one data, and it's pretty straightforward. Easy, right? Um, so there's two ways you can send more data with parallel. Let's say you have high bandwidth needs uh, and you want to send more data across your across an interface. So you can take a, a single PCI connector, maybe you can add a bunch more and have more parallel paths uh, in your design and send more data that way. The other thing you can do is you can crank up the clock speed, but this falls apart pretty quickly. And let's talk about why that is. So the fundamental problem of parallel interfaces is something called clock skew. And basically what it means is um, as your clock speed increases, skew, is, skew becomes a big problem. So, you know, we're dealing with um, really fast data rates here in the gigabits per second, gigahertz, 
right? We saw it through these transceivers on the first page that were 12 gigahertz, uh, gigabits per second. And yeah, there's a rule of thumb that's wire that electricity travels down a wire uh, around like one foot of wire in one nanosecond, which if you have a one gigahertz data rate, uh, one nanosecond is the period of a bit. So that means that every foot has a new bit on it. HDMI runs at 12 gigahertz, so now every inch has a new bit. So if you imagine an HDMI cable that's a foot long, you can have 12 bits on that cable all at the same time. And um, what, what ends up falling apart here is that the edges of your clock and synchronizing all those, those pieces of those parallel data interfaces together becomes impossible. Like even if your wires are a little bit, if one wire is a little bit longer than, it, than its neighbor, then data arrives at different times at your receiver. And when that happens, um, you, you, you know, you're fighting, you're really fighting physics at the wire level. Like if, if you're cutting a wire and you accidentally cut it a few millimeters too short, you might lose your data. And controlling that for like, a, you know, $6 Amazon HDMI cable is like impossible. Um, you know, you can control it on a PCB by you know, laying out exactly the right length traces on a PCB. But when you, when you go into a cable interface, it falls apart. Uh, and just in general, matching, matching all the properties of a transmitter and a receiver uh, electrically is, is really challenging. So take it for granted that clock skew just completely falls apart for parallel interfaces. So we need to do something different for uh, sending data faster. And what we do is we use something called serial. And the main thing about serial is that we embed the clock in the data. So now instead of having a clock and a data, you combine them together somehow and you have them in just one, uh, you send them together at the same time. This is fundamental. So what happens on the transmitter side is the transmitter will encode the clock and the data together. You have to come up with some encoding scheme, and we're going to talk about a few options for that. And the receiver needs to know what the receiver and transmitter both use the same encoding and decoding scheme. Um, and then the receiver will extract the clock and the data. So the clock and the data is still needed on the receiving side, but the receiver will kind of extract the clock and data uh, on its own, which is pretty cool. You still need the clock to sample your data line to know when when to sample the data line. Um, but the receiver itself can get its own clock, which is kind of cool. So three things to talk about when it comes to CERTES and high-speed serial communication. The encoding scheme itself to encode, to take your clock and your data and encode them into a, just one uh, one data path. And the channel itself, so how does the, the cable work and what does it look like from a wiring perspective. And then also the input and output stages of, uh, in this case it would be an FPGA. Um, what do those do? What's special about those? So let's talk about um, the clock encoding scheme. So you can take a couple things about clock encoding. Um, you need to guarantee data transitions. Um, a, long, a long set of zeros and ones needs some transitions. So you can imagine if you want to send like you know, 128 bits of all zeros, you're, you're going to eventually lose, your receiver is not going to know when to sample the data. So you're going to have to introduce some transitions into even long data streams. You have to introduce transitions so that your receiver can know like, okay, there's an edge. I'm going to resynchronize to that new edge now. And if those are too far apart, it, falls, it, it doesn't work. So here's an example, something called Manchester encoding. You take clock, you take data, you can create a Manchester encoded version. And this contains information to extract both clock and data. This is pretty simple. Um, and it's a little, it's older, not not super common these days. Um, HDLC uses its own clock encoding scheme, um, but 8B, 10B is by far the most popular. And we're going to talk in detail about that because it's kind of cool. All right, 8B, 10B encoding. Um, 8B, 10B encoding takes eight bits of data, so a byte, and converts it to 10 bits of data, which is an immediate hit to your total bandwidth. Um, right off the top, because now you need to send two extra bits to get eight, you know, you send 10 bits to get eight bits, but it's totally worth it in the long run. And the reason why it's worth it is because it guarantees a few things. One, it guarantees something called the DC balance of your line. So DC is direct current. So basically the voltage at which your, your, your channel is sitting at is guaranteed to be DC balanced. So if you imagine you send a long stream of, you know, if you have the HDMI cable that's a foot long and you send 12 ones in a row, that's going to bias your HDMI cable to like some positive voltage. It's going to, um, it's going to like charge up the actual wires that are on your cable. Uh, and you really want to maintain 
And then, then let's say let's say you're charged up to like the rail of a voltage on your cable, and then you want to switch and go the other direction. So you want to send a zero now, and that there's actually so much bias to the it's called you know it's DC biased upward to whatever voltage you've been sending. If you want to pull it back downward again, it's harder to do that. So you really want to maintain a DC balance of your of the data that you're sending. So for every one, there's a zero. For every zero, there's a one, and then that's that's DC balanced. Uh, the second thing I did mention this before, but you want to guarantee that you have some transitions on your on your data. So if you have just a long stream of zeros or ones, you're not going to have the ability to do clock data recovery or CDR on your receiver. Your, your receiver is going to like wait for a transition, and eventually it's going to lose what's called lock, um, which is your PLL. Your PLL on the receiver side is just going to lose lose the lock and be unable to. Um, recover the data at that point. So even if you're sending a long stream of zeros or ones, there's always transitions occurring. And AP10B guarantees that by the encoding standard. This is a super common interface um, encoding scheme. It's used on DVI, DisplayPort, Ethernet, Firewire, HDMI, PCI Express, SATA, and USB. And I'm sure you've heard of at least a few of those. So it's very common, although you may never have heard of it. Now, if you're implementing a CERTES transceiver in an FPGA, you're, you're probably going to be uh, dealing with AP encoding on your transmitter and AP, D, AP10B decoding on your receiver. Next big thing, channel optimization. So this is the actual cable itself. How do you optimize that to be, this is this whole thing, you know, all search, sending data fast is all about fine tuning every single piece along the way. So now we're talking about the cable itself. Uh, how do you make that really, really great? The key thing is the most important thing I think is sing single ended versus differential data transmission. All, pretty much all fast data transmissions are differential um, versus single ended. So single ended is your you know your transmitter on the left, the receiver on the right. Um, your re single ended means that your transmitter and receiver have a common ground and just one data path, and they send you know a, a one is three point three volts and a zero is zero volts, and your receiver can compare the the ground to the new data coming in and know what the value is of that particular data. That works pretty good for um, you know, short runs. It works pretty good for slow data rates. But if you need to send data over a long run over or at fast data rates, you need to use differential, which is requiring two wires. So you've taken a hit on the number of wires, but it's way better from like a signal integrity perspective. I could talk about this on its own. But um, from a signal integrity perspective, differential is much better. And from speed, you can get much faster speed out of it. So um, LVDS is a very common uh, differential standard, low voltage differential signaling. And it's just taking, you know, instead a one is one wire going positive, the other wire going negative, and a zero is you switch the two. So you're always in some, um, the, the two wires are always opposite each other from a voltage perspective. And that is just better, take it for granted that it is better. One extra pin, but the trade-off is, is totally worth it. Um, so that's one thing. Difference always send your, your data is always sent differentially, and um, the again the, the quality of the channel is very important. You know you're you're sending data at such high data rates that your what you assume in an electronics class is like a zero uh, zero ohm impedance uh, cable. There actually is some resistance there. There is some capacitance to to copper. It's small. But if you're sending data at a really fast data rate, you know you still have these voltage. You know you imagine a, a clock is like instantly going from zero to one, but in fact there is some rise time associated with that, and that's really the time it takes to like charge your wires up. Um, and so the faster you can, the faster you need to go, the the, the more that this becomes a big deal. So one uh, quality measurement that is used is something called an intersymbol interference diagram or an eye chart. Looks like it's called an eye chart because it literally looks like an eye if you look at the picture. Um, and the more open you can get that eye to be, the better. That means that you're less likely to have bit errors in your in your data rate, in your channel, um, at faster and faster data rates. So open eye is better. And you can you can get you can generate these plots by using a very expensive oscilloscope and uh, generate your own eye charts, which is kind of fun to do. And the last thing to mention is there, like I said, there's tricks on the FPGA itself inside the FPGA fabric. These are why these blocks are like transceiver blocks. They're pieces of hard 
hard silicon built into the to the FPGA. You can't just instantiate one; they're built in. And one, of, they do some tricks. They do something like, for example, pre-emphasis and post-emphasis, where they actually, instead of sending, you know, 0.3 or 0.7 volts, I forget LVDS is 0.7 or 0.3, whatever, um, 0.4. Mm. Anyway, instead of sending like a voltage and having that be a one, they actually drive a little bit above that voltage for a small amount of time and then come back down again. So it's actually kind of cheating in a way, uh, but it does help. It does help things. It helps you. It helps those. Um, those charge up times where you're charging a wire and you're going from a zero to a one, you can get there faster if you over bias, if you overdrive the line for a small amount of time. Um, and that's what pre-emphasis is really doing. You're overdriving your line and then coming back down again to kind of charge it up, get, get that data to push through and really transition as quickly as possible, change states as super fast. This is all about just eking out as much performance as you can from your copper your FPGA and just cranking up the bandwidth and getting data through that interface as fast as possible. So FPGAs, why are FPGAs like good at this, right? Why, why is this a common use case? Well, FPGAs are fast. You can run your internal clocks at very high frequencies and ship this data uh, in and out of an FPGA, no problem. Um, and a lot of them have these built-in CERTES blocks, serialization, deserialization blocks. So you can just instantiate uh, a lot of different, you know, inputs and outputs to an FPGA and MUX data or send it to, you know, from, from this transmitter to that one and do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and there's many, there are many different applications depending on the industry. So radar applications for like defense industry and there's networking applications, sh shipping packets around, things like that. Tons of camera applications. So any high speed, um, video interfaces all use CERTES blocks. Uh, so this is extremely common use case for FPGAs. Again, a lot of high-end FPGAs have many CERTES blocks just for this reason. I hope that was informative. hope it gave you a good background on CERTES and why it's useful in an FPGA. If you enjoyed this video, please go to patreon.com slash nandland and support me there. It helps me creating this good content. So thank you.